lot about the importance of social relationships today. Our final uh, bit, we're going to hear more about one particular long-lasting and very public relationship. They've been together, worked to get together, uh, I mean by that, for 25 years, 18 years at SBS as co-host of the movie show, the last seven at the ABC on At The Movies. Please welcome Margaret Pomerantz and David Stratton. The two of us, and we'll be always traveling on. Wow. It's so funny coming after Bettina because we've had 25 years without sex. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been good, hasn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the only way to go for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely to be invited here to talk at this very special conference. I mean, what a gorgeous concept, and we right in the middle of it because we've been so lucky for all of our working life. But actually, I was saying to David, it goes back longer than 25 years because a couple of years before the movie show started on SBS, um, I was I didn't know David, and I he was introducing movies on SBS. And I tried to talk to him about because I was passionate about film. You were working at SBS as, as, a, a, as writer, a writer, producer, producer and yeah. you know I tried to approach him to talk about various films, and it was you know the brush off. <laughs> He's good at that. <laughs> <laughs> and the head of SBS at the time said to me that he wanted me to be David's producer, and I said I, I actually don't think that's a good idea because I don't think he likes me. And he did. <laughs> well, the thing was, I didn't know you. And, and I, believe it or not, I'm quite a shy person. Oh. <laughs> and uh, I, I find it difficult to talk to people I don't really know. And you're quite the opposite. You're a sort of gregarious, aren't you? Chatty mm. person. Well, yes. whatever. Yeah. I, I thought you thought I was strange. And I <laughs> no, I didn't think, well, no more than I do now. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it, it, it's true that the producer, the, the head of production said, look, um, because I was, I was introducing these, these movies on SBS and, and selecting them and, and programming them and, and just saying a few words before them. And uh, I didn't really have anyone who was sort of seeing me through all this, producing it. And then Margaret was imposed upon me and uh, I wasn't too sure because to begin with she had the most terrible ideas I thought I thought they were good <laughs> she wanted me to walk onto the set through a, a sort of avenue of blown up photographs of her favorite movie stars like Toshiro Mifune and Alan yeah. Delon I mean they were fine Stars. Yeah. The only trouble was that the, 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 the studio at, at uh, SBS was about the size of this, half the size of this stage, so it was a bit difficult to sort of walk along up to the... Well, the ceiling height was the problem. It was just an office block and for a studio, you need this height. So anyway, eventually Margaret did produce um, the show, my, my in introductions, and uh, she... she she did a great job. She had some. I, she I did wanted have some him good to ideas. grow a ponytail, uh, rip off the tie, and I thought you'd say rip off the shirt. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, David was a little bit obdurate about most things, but um, out of that relationship, uh, we used to go for lunch and talk about film. And one of the films that the early films that we disagreed about was an Australian film called The Empty Beach, which starred Brian Brown. And I had, I was very dismissive about this film. And I listened to David and he had such a generous approach to it that he made me see it in a completely different way. And so we spent many, many hours talking about film and that whole thing of, wouldn't it be great if because Australia didn't have, at that stage, uh, any program about film. We had Peter Thompson on the Sunday program talking about one film a week, but there was nothing that dealt with all the films being released in a week. And 
and, and, and we, were, we were looking overseas and we saw that in England, a guy called Barry Norman had been doing a program on the BBC um, about films every week, looking at all the films opening in England. And in America, there was a, a long-running program actually called At The Movies uh, with uh, Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel, uh, two guys who hated one another um, and who, who, again, discussed and argued about all the, the, the movies opening every week. And we thought it would be great if there was a program in Australia, something like that, dedicated to the new movies. Uh, and it would be better to pick the Siskel Ebert formula, but even better if Siskel was a woman. Exactly. I, I, we really wanted to have that difference of opinion, male, female. And I tried, I was only going to produce the program. I tried desperately to find a woman that David would approve of and like. <laughs> and the only ones that he said yes, okay to weren't prepared to do it with him. It was <laughs> It wasn't that they didn't like him. It was that they weren't prepared to do television, I think. Mm. Uh, they all had other jobs and they didn't want to, you know, I don't know, it's a funny creature, television. So uh, we were desperate. <laughs> 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 the head of programming asked me to audition and I was, I said, no, I only want to produce and I really am a very happy producer. And then David says, I'll go, give it a go. And I did. And <laughs> I'll, let you, I'll let you into a secret here. We did, <laughs> we did two pilots. This is in 1986, SBS, very small television station. We did two pilots of this proposed program, and Margaret had stage fright, camera fright, whatever, I don't know, but <laughs> she, she was <laughs> petrified. So we got her drunk. Oh, you did not get me drunk. I had a short little sip of whiskey to or get me through it. <laughs> or three. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> and so the result was that these pilots, I mean, she actually did them, but we couldn't show them to anybody <laughs> because... <laughs> really, it was, I mean, if anybody's still got those parts, it would be, <laughs> that would be shocking, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, they were pretty shocking. Yeah. But we managed to actually make a program finally. I, the David and I disagree about just about everything, including, ha you know, the details of the early days of we the show. We did two I pilots. thought we did four pilots, yeah. he says two. Anyway, uh, he says that they couldn't afford a real producer, a real presenter, so they got me. He tells that to everybody, and it really gets up my nerves. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it was the most extraordinary thing, because, and it would never happen these days. No one at SBS saw the show before it went to air. And I had a party at my house, and I invited everybody. There were filmmakers like Philip Noyce and David Elphick, including all the big wigs at SBS, and that was the first time they, they'd seen the program was when it went to air in my lounge room. It was so <laughs> bizarre, come to think of it. It was. But once it started, it just kept on going, and 25 years down the track, here we are. It's quite amazing, and it's... <laughs> thank you. It's bizarre when you say a quarter of a century it's somehow weightier, don't you reckon? Yes, quarter of a century sounds like a long time. It does. But, but the thing that's been wonderful about it is that we're both doing something that we love. And David is really a film obsessive. And I, next week on the show, we're talking about classic films one a week these days, which is giving us a lot of joy. And I hope it's giving all our viewers as much. But his film next week uh, is Letter from an Unknown Woman. Which uh, is a 1948 Hollywood film made by a European director, and it's wonderful. Uh, and I've got a few issues with it, but we were <laughs> discussing... <laughs> we, we were discussing it, and David was telling me about another film. Well, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen Letter from Unknown Moon, but 
it was made in 1948. In 1933, so 15 years earlier, uh, there's another film made based on a completely different story, but a very similar story, uh, called Only Yesterday. And, and uh, it, it's set in 1929. Uh, the stock market crash has just happened. There's a, a banker who's suddenly discovered that he's bankrupt. Um, he's desperate. He leaves his office in a, in a sort of daze, goes home, uh, takes a, a, a gun out of his drawer, and then he sees a letter on his desk. And he starts to read it, and it's from a woman that he'd known 20, no, not 20 years, uh, yeah, about, about 15 years earlier, actually, and who he had completely forgotten. And he'd spent one night with her, and as a result, she had had a child that he never knew about. And uh, now she's writing to say that she's dying. This sounds terribly mawkish, I know, but it isn't. Uh, and uh, he goes to her house uh, to see if he can see her. Uh, but she's already died. And then he meets, for the first time, his son. And he's talking to the boy uh, who's in his school uniform. And the boy doesn't know who he is. And he's saying to him, uh, well, you know, how are you going at school? And so on and so on. And he said, one of these days, we, we, we must go out together, maybe go fishing or something. I'm choking up, talking, telling this story. And the boy says, why would you do that? And he says, because I'm your father. The end. But I love that film. <laughs> but, you know, th the thing was that David, telling me about this film only yesterday, um, he's got tears in his eyes telling me about it. And I just want to put my arms around him <laughs> and hug him. Because, you know, he loves cinema so much. And he is actually so generous with his love of cinema. You know, he's given so much to me, and he gives it to so many people over so many years. I'm actually a very strange person because uh, <laughs> it, it, it actually started when I was about 10 years old, and I was at boarding school, and uh, after the holidays, I would come back to school, and for the first several nights, I would, after lights out, when we were supposed not to talk, I would tell everybody else in the dormitory the stories of the films that I'd seen over the holidays and I saw as many as I could, um, and, and they loved it. I mean, my, the fellow, I wasn't good at much at school, but I was good at that. And so later on, when I was a teenager, I, I started a film society in my hometown so that I could show the films I loved to other people. And then I came to Australia, and I found myself running the Sydney Film Festival for 18 years, selecting films that I loved and showing them to audiences and hoping they'd like them. And then on SBS, I was doing the same sort of thing. And I'm still doing the same sort of thing uh, when I lecture at the University of Sydney. And that is my happiness. I'm not creative, but my happiness is trying to persuade everybody else to love the same thing, films that I love. And the only <laughs> time I'm unhappy is when they don't. <laughs> Every year, the um, at the movies team or the movie show team uh, goes. We have a Christmas celebration at David's place up in the mountains outside Sydney, and we usually have a program of about four to five films. And David's got this magnificent home cinema set up, as you can imagine. With ev he doesn't spend his money on clothes; he spends it on technical gear <laughs> for his <laughs> home cinema. And he's even got curtains that, you know. That was the latest expense. It was, it's beautiful. Lights that dim. You know. <laughs> it's the whole experience. And we all go up there and David stands up and introduces Pontificate. each film to us. No, you don't pontificate. You, you share something really lovely about a film. And, the, and the, the beautiful thing is that even though we don't always agree about films, um, I sort of feel I've missed out if he's loved something that I haven't. And I hope he feels the same, but I don't think he does. <laughs> 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 it's funny because last night in Sydney, uh, at the Sydney Film Festival, uh, we did a session like this, not quite so many people, I think there were about 700 people last night in Sydney, um, where we were talking about just that, actually, the films that we have disagreed about over 25 years, the films that we... We just, 
I get passionate about and Margaret says, no, it's rubbish, and, and vice versa. Um, and that was an interesting exercise. But Margaret's been saying nice things about me. I would say about Margaret, the, the thing, about, and I'm sure any of you who've watched the program would know that the wonderful thing about Margaret is her passion. She is the most passionate person. <laughs> really irritates him on occasion, so. <laughs> Not really. I mean, I, I appreciate, I appreciate your, your, your well, amazing, it's an amazing passion that you have. But do you know, I think Misplaced that sometimes. That's, <laughs> that's why, what cinema does, actually, it, it gives you that passion and compassion. And I always remember you telling me about uh, that David's a, uh, such a blubber about films, you know. Such a what? You blubber, you cry. And, but I, I love that in him, you know. There are, uh, men don't do that very often for that, for cinema to get through to you to that extent. And you had that example of, the, of that scene in The Grapes of Wrath. Yeah, I mean, cinema gets to me on a very primal, emotional level. And I do get, when I know a film very well, and I've seen it many times, and Margaret's mentioned a wonderful film, The Grapes of Wrath, which John Ford made in 1940, based on the book by John Steinbeck. And if you've read the book or you've seen the film, you'll know that uh, it's the story of displaced uh, tenant farmers, mostly from Oklahoma, who because of the uh, terrible climactic conditions, the, the so-called dust bowl, the, the drought and, and the soil being eroded by winds and so forth, have just completely lost everything. And they've been evicted from their farms. And they've set out for a better life in, in California, uh, the, the sort of dream place to go. Um, and it's about the Jode family who have piled everything, all their what's left of their belongings into this sort of battered truck and the whole family uh, are there and they're heading across country this very long arduous trip with with almost no money to finance it and there's a wonderful I mean the film is full of great scenes but there's a wonderful scene which makes me choke up every time I see it uh, where they stop at a, at a truck stop somewhere in the middle of nowhere um, to fill up with petrol gas and grandpa uh, goes in to the uh, shop uh, which is also a kind of general store uh, to pay for the petrol and the his two little grandkids who are I don't know, probably eight and ten something like that who are hungry they're really hungry and they come in with him and inside this shop there's a sort of cafe too and there's a couple of truck drivers, there's a big truck parked outside, there's a couple of truck drivers who are having a cup of coffee or whatever. And there's a very sort of down-to-earth woman behind the counter and she's saying, you know, okay, you're paying for the petrol, is anything else you want? And the kids are looking at some food, some cakes or something, some, something to eat that's there. And the truck drivers see the kids looking and they look at one another and the kid... They, they signal to the woman behind the counter and the woman behind the counter gives the children something to eat. And Grandpa says, but, you know, I can't pay for it. And the woman says, that's okay. And they go out, Grandpa and the kids go out. And then the truck drivers say, okay, thanks, Maisie, and they go out. And the camera moves in on Maisie and she says, truck driver. That's all she says, truck drivers. It's a wonderful scene. I can't tell you what a wonderful scene that is. And I, I, I have to admit it, I start to weep in that scene and I'm weeping then for the rest of the picture. I do get very emotional. <laughs> in yes, but uh, you see, I think that's, it, it's a strange sort of happiness when a filmmaker has the power to move you to that extent. And the one film that has done that to me in the last couple of years is Samson and Delilah and I don't know whether you've seen it the, the film about indigenous kids who have it's such a rough road of a film 
minimal dialogue, beautifully shot by Warwick Gordon, the director. And it's sort of gruelling. And at the end, these kids are out in Wop Wop by themselves, delivered from the safety of the, from the dangers of the town. And there is just this hint of a smile on Delilah's face at the end. That's the only concession the filmmaker gives you to any sort of hope for these kids. And I walked out of that cinema and it was like two minutes later and it just hit me like a thunderbolt. Uh, and I was, you know, sobbing, sobbing in the street uh, because of the effect of that film, because it's the, that compassion that uh, filmmakers can offer you and that sense of that compassion in human beings that can create something <coughs> tremendously moving. Mm. Yeah, I think so. And, and I think it's, it's, it, it is why I love cinema so much, that, that it can do, I mean, it can do many, many things. It can thrill you, it can make you laugh, it can... But on, on the most primal level, yes. that... Yes, they're the most important films to me. Emotional connection, yes. um, wi which deals with all those things, is so powerful. And we've been very lucky, Margaret and me. We've both uh, been very fortunate that over the years we've been able to uh, enjoy... Our See, very few good films and a lot of really bad ones. <laughs> 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 yes. And, and, uh, but... but not many people get the chance to do basically what they like. Even when we're seeing bad films, you know, it's, well, it's bad, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but but we have been able to make a career out of what we love. And, and not many people get to do that, I think. And, and that's what's and given us happiness. Well, not, uh, not only that, I mean... You know, we've been, we started on SBS and it was great because we, it was this little tiny station, this little tiny program that no one knew about. We made so many mistakes on air. It was great that no one was watching. Um, and, but over the years, it's, you know, people have gotten to know us and, you know, it's so lovely that, you know, there's been enthusiasm for our program about film. And one of the most gorgeous things about my job is that I walk around the cities of this country and I meet people I don't know in the streets and they smile at me. That is a most beautiful thing. I think if my job has given me that, it's a pretty wonderful uh, experience to have. It's so nice that that is coming back to you. And I think that, you know, that's what we've got with one another. We're nice to one another and he makes me laugh. <laughs> I, Margaret, people smile at Margaret. I was telling you a story that happened to me in Sydney uh, some weeks ago now. I was walking up George Street, the main street in Sydney, hurrying to a preview. And um, suddenly, somebody grabbed me in the rear. <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I turned around and there was this very attractive young woman. And I was very startled, as you can imagine, and she said, David, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> that made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? <laughs> no, you no would, damn it. <laughs> you'd call the police if it did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been, fa it's been a grand ride and... I also think that, you know, it's not just the love of films. It's a great affection between David and myself and lovely respect. I think I respect him more than he does me, but that's okay. But not, not at, at the all. same time, I've had some pretty terrible experiences during those 25 years, some very serious illnesses that I've had to deal with within my family, not me, um, that have been really, really tough times. And... David sings to me. He sings these funny little ditties to cheer me up. He has got a great kindness in him and he can actually keep a tune. And, <laughs> a, 
And I, I'm going to make you all very happy by not singing. <laughs> this is the most wonderful conference. Everybody is so kind and you've all got smiles on your faces. Uh, it's a perfect advertisement for a happiness conference. And we've got them too. So thank you very much for having us today. Thank you very much.